the pulpit of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, this is Pathway to Victory with Dr. Robert Jeffers. Hi, I'm Robert Jeffers, and welcome again to Pathway to Victory. As Christians, we understand that good works can never earn God's forgiveness, but that doesn't mean our good deeds are worthless. In fact, the way we spend our life here on earth will greatly determine our rewards in heaven. There's a day coming when God will judge the obedience of every believer, and the results of that judgment will have eternal implications. We're answering the question, will heaven be the same for everyone? on today's edition of Pathway to Victory. In our series, A Place Called Heaven, we began addressing the question last time, will heaven be the same for everyone? And the answer, the surprising answer for many is, no, it will not be the same for everyone. While becoming a Christian exempts us from the condemnation of God, and aren't we grateful for that? It exempts us from God's condemnation. Being a Christian does not exempt us from God's evaluation of our life. The fact is every person, non-Christian and Christian alike, will be judged by God. The judgment for non-Christians is the judgment, the great white throne judgment, those who have not trusted in Christ, whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life, they are ca cast into the lake of fire and tormented day and night forever and ever. But those of us who are Christians are going to stand before a different judgment. It's an evaluation of our life. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That phrase, judgment seat, bema, refers to a raised platform in which the governor or some other official were reward, would reward those who had done exceptionally well in games or some other type of contest. One day we're going to stand before God's judgment to receive rewards for what we have done. Now I've given you a sentence on your outline to help you understand the difference between the judgment for Christians at the judgment seat of Christ and the judgment of non-Christians at the great white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ is for the commendation of believers, while the great white throne judgment is for the condemnation of unbelievers. Uh, how will we be judged? Well, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, we will be judged according to what we have done. This evaluation of our lives as Christians is based on our works, what we've done. Now, that confuses a lot of Christians because they say, well, wait a minute, I thought our good works don't matter. Well, they don't matter before we're saved, but they matter a great deal after we're saved. And we made the distinction last time between our works before we become a Christian. Prior to our salvation, the best you and I can do is like a filthy rag to God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 makes it very clear, it's by grace we are saved and that not of works, lest anyone should boast. Good works play absolutely no role in earning salvation. However, our good works have a great value after our salvation. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are saved not by works, but for good works. Again, here's a sentence on your outline to write down. While our works are worthless in securing us a place in heaven... They are integral in determining our experience in heaven. Good works can't earn you your place in heaven. That's only by God's grace, by trusting Christ. But once you've done that, your good works matter in determining the kind of experience you will have in heaven. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's first of all begin by looking at exactly what happens at the judgment seat of Christ. Since you're going to stand there one day, wouldn't you like to know exactly what's going to happen at that judgment? Well, to explain what happens at the judgment seat of Christ, Paul uses three analogies. 
The first analogy is the trustee analogy. And it's found in Romans chapter 14. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 14. Paul is writing to Christians in Rome. They were busy judging one another. There were divisions in the Roman church. And Paul said, quit your judging of one another. He says in verse 10, but why, why do you judge your brother? Or why again do you regard your brother with contempt? You are not to judge another. When he says don't judge your brother, he was talking about Christians who were pronouncing judgments about behavior the Bible didn't even address. Christians were judging each other about what they ate or what they drank or about whether they kept the Sabbath days or not. And Paul said, quit judging people. Let everybody be convinced in his own heart about that because every one of us, look at verse 10, will stand before the judgment seat of God. One day you and I are going to answer to God, not to one another, for these areas the Bible doesn't address. Verse 11, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. That's a quotation from Isaiah 45. Did you know everybody who's ever lived is one day going to bow before Jesus Christ? Some will bow before him at the great white throne judgment. They will acknowledge him as judge and it will be too late for them. But others who have received God's grace, we too will reaffirm that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then the conclusion, verse 12, so then each one of us as Christians shall give an account of himself to God. Now there's that trustee analogy. That word, give an account, is a word that referred to a financial manager. You know, if you want to, you can entrust your assets to a manager who will oversee them and invest them on your behalf. Now, he doesn't own the assets, you do. He has a responsibility, a trust agreement to maximize your assets for good. That is the responsibility of the trustee. He doesn't own anything. He's simply a manager of what's been entrusted to him. And as we saw a few weeks ago, you and I, we don't own anything. We're simply managers. We don't own our money. God does. We don't own our lives. We don't even determine how long our lives are. God does. He's just entrusted to us a certain amount of treasure and time and opportunities and gifts. And our responsibility with what he's entrusted to us, listen to this, is to further his agenda, not our agenda. And although we have a lot of latitude in what we do with our money and our time and our talent, one day we will give an account to God for what we've done with those things we've managed. Uh, just as uh, the trustee gives an account to the owner of what he's done. And that's the illusion here. Now, what's interesting is, in this trust agreement, as trustees, we only will give an account to the owner, God, of what he's entrusted to us, not to what he's entrusted to other people. You know, when I stand before God, my judgment at the judgment seat of Christ is going to be very personal and individualized. God is not going to judge me according to the same standard he judges Billy Graham. God has given to Dr. Graham certain gifts and certain opportunities that are unique to him. He's not going to say to me, you know, oh, why didn't you... Uh, Preach more faithfully in that stadium filled with 100,000 people. Well, I never had that opportunity. Dr. Graham did. And so he's going to give Dr. Graham a different judgment than he judges me. He's going to judge you according to a different standard than that which he judges me. The judgment seat of Christ is going to be a very personalized, individualized judgment according to what has been entrusted to us. That is the trustee analogy. Secondly, he uses the construction analogy to describe the bema, the judgment seat. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 3. Notice what he says here. According to the grace of God, verse 10, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it, for no man can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul is inviting you to think about your life like a house that's being constructed. Now, every Christian has the same foundation for his house. Your life is like a house that you construct. 
You have the same foundation as every other Christian, and that is that foundation is the unchangeable Jesus Christ. We're all saved if we've trusted in Christ. Jesus is our foundation. But we have a choice of what kind of house, that is what kind of life, we build on the foundation of our salvation. And the choice of what kind of house we build depends upon the kind of building material we choose. Look at verse 12. Now, if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw, you can build your life according to what building materials you choose. But notice one day, the kind of life you have built is going to be tested by the fire of God's judgment. Verse 13, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will reveal the quality of each man's work. Would you notice the two criteria God is going to use to judge the kind of life you and I have built? Number one, the significance of our life. The significance or the durability of our works. For example, if you spend your time and talents and treasures here on earth pursuing power and profits and self-glorification, that's like building a house of wood or hay or straw. I'm not talking about building a life that's built on evil. I'm just talking about a worthless life, a life that is centered around your own agenda, agenda, profits, power, or pleasure. What happens at the judgment if your life is built with those things? It's not like the story of the three pigs where Jesus will huff and puff and blow your house down. Instead, he just sets a match to it, burns it up. That's what he's saying here. Nothing will last. It will be consumed with fire. On the other hand, you can build your life with more durable materials, gold, silver, precious stones. A life that is built around glorifying God, making him look good, no matter what your daily responsibilities are. A life built around sharing Christ with as many people as possible. A life built around giving up some temporary pleasures and perks in this life to invest your money in God's kingdom. Those things really matter to God. They make a difference. It's a life built with gold, silver, and precious stones. Verse 14, if any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. But notice verse 15, if any man's work is burned up, that is evaluated to be worthless. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, though as by fire. That's probably a, a, a saying like we would have today. He will be saved by the skin of his teeth. Have you ever heard that before? He'll make it to heaven. If you're truly a Christian and your life is judged to be worthless, you'll still get into heaven, but you'll smell of smoke. You'll just barely make it there though is by fire. That's what he's talking to here, by the skin of your teeth. So the first criterion of judgment will be the significance of our works. The second judgment will be according to the motives of our works. Sometimes why we do what we do is as important as what we do. In 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul says, therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. God cares about our motives. You know, if you give money to God's work in order to be able to brag to others how much you're giving, that doesn't count for gold, it counts as wood. If you are diligent in sharing your faith with other people so that you can brag about how many people are in the kingdom because of you, that's not silver. That's hay. Our motives really do matter before God. Proverbs 16, 2 says, All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Now, some of you might ask, well, Pastor, isn't living your life in order to earn rewards, isn't that kind of a selfish motive? Isn't that self-centered? I want to earn all these rewards so I can have a better spot in heaven than other people? That sounds pretty selfish to me. Look, 
Selfishness, somebody said, is, is, is trying to achieve at somebody else's expense. Selfishness is trying to gain more at somebody else's expense. But did you know it's possible to gain more at God's expense? Because God does not have a finite amount of resources that if you take some from him, he has less. He has an inexhaustible supply of riches. When he rewards you, his net worth is not diminished one iota. In fact, when you think about it, working for rewards is really a sign of what God values most in our life, and that is faith. Think, for example, about Abraham. Why is it that Abraham was willing to uproot his family and travel to a land he didn't even know where he was going to? What was his motive in leaving everybody and everything familiar behind him? Verse 10 of Hebrews 11 says, Abraham was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He did it for heaven. He obeyed God because of the rewards that awaited him in heaven. Or think about Moses. Moses voluntarily surrendered the perks of living in Pharaoh's household to identify with God's people, the Israelites. Why was he willing to give up those privileges? Out of his dedication to God alone? Partly, but not completely. Verse 25 of Hebrews 11 says, Moses choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin Considering, verse 26, the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the what? To the reward. Verse 26, that word considering, Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater than the rewards of Egypt. That word consider is a, a, a mathematic term. It means to calculate, to calculate. In other words, as Moses was weighing what decision he was going to make, he did the math in his head. He said, okay, the choice is temporary pleasure in, Moses, in Pharaoh's household or eternal riches in heaven. Hey, I think I'll choose the latter. The eternal riches are better than temporary pleasure. He did the math. He calculated the rewards in heaven were worth, was what was worth living for. That wasn't a selfish motive. You know, when you give up temporary money, pleasure, pursuits in this life in order to earn rewards, that's the essence of what faith is. Remember in Hebrews 11, 1, God says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then in verse 6, he says, for he who comes to God must believe that God is and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When you give up the temporary for the eternal, whether it's your money, your time, your energy, when you make that trade, you're showing the essence of faith. God, I believe what you've said. I believe you reward those who diligently follow after you. Now, the third analogy here is the race analogy. It's found in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. Just look at... Um, Verses 24 and 25. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who complete, competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. You know, the greatest threat to a runner is becoming distracted, not keeping your eye on the finish line. And what Paul is saying here is, I don't run without aim. I keep my mind on the finish line. You know, it's so easy for those of us who are Christians to be distracted, to forget why we're here, to spend our time, not in evil things, that's not what I'm talking about, but spend our time reading our Facebook or Twitter feeds or watching television and or, or getting caught up in the news or getting caught up in this pursuit. Nothing wrong with any of those things unless it distracts you from doing that one thing God has left you to do. That's the race analogy. 
Well, what are the consequences? I mean, if we're all going to make it to heaven anyway, does it really matter? Do these eternal rewards matter? Well, there are two possible outcomes of our standing at the judgment seat of Christ. One possible outcome is rewards. There will be rewards for some Christians. Theologian Norm Geisler says it this way, everyone in heaven will be fully blessed, but not everyone will be equally blessed. Every believer's cup will be full and running over, but not everyone's cup will be the same size. God cares how you behave. God cares what you do in this life. Again, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we shall be judged according to the deeds we have done in the body, whether they're good or worthless. These rewards that Christians receive, some Christians receive, are referred to sometimes in the Bible as crowns. How many of you have heard about a Christian's crown in heaven? Are these crowns literal crowns? Some people believe they are. Of course, you know, you have to wonder if you have more than one or two, how's that going to work walking around with four or five? Most of us won't have to worry about that, but a few might. How does that work out? Other people say, well, we're going to cast them all before the throne and it doesn't matter. My own belief is these crowns may be literal crowns. And indeed, we may cast them before the throne of God as a sign of our worship of God. But that doesn't negate the fact that these crowns represent real, tangible rewards that will extend throughout eternity. Can you recall... Look back in your life and recall something your mom or dad might have said to you that was especially encouraging to you. Son, daughter, I'm so proud of you. Or maybe you can think of something your employer said to you, like, you know, you're doing such a great job. We couldn't make it in this company if it weren't for you. You know, you hold on to those things, don't you? You replay them over and over in your mind. If, if we can get that excited about what a parent or an employer says to us, think about what it's going to be like if we were to stand before God at the judgment seat and see a smile across the face of Jesus saying, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. That's a reward worth working for. And that's what's going to be awaiting some in heaven. Special privileges, special positions, special praise. One possible outcome of the judgment we're all going to stand before is rewards. The other possible outcome is regrets. The forfeiture of rewards. Some people will stand before Jesus in shame. And I don't make up that word shame. It's a biblical word. 1 John 2 verse 28 says, And now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. There will be real measurable loss some people will experience in heaven. And there'll be regret as people look and see what could have been theirs had they been more faithful to Christ in this life. Joy and regret can exist at the same time. And it'll be that same emotion for those who see their lives burned up at the judgment seat of Christ and being termed as absolutely worthless. Now, we have to be careful here to overdo the sorrow, regret aspect of the judgment seat of Christ is to turn heaven into hell. But to underemphasize it is to make obedience in this life inconsequential. Rewards will matter. In his, bar, in his book, Your Eternal Reward, my friend Erwin Lutzer tells a fable about an Indian beggar who stood by the road every day to beg rice from any passerby who would be so generous. He stood there by the dusty road, and in his bowl, he had a few grains of rice just to get people started with the idea of generosity. One day as he stood there, he saw this elegant chariot racing toward him. And when the chariot stopped in front of him, a wealthy raja descended from the chariot. 
He went over to the beggar. The beggar's heart was filled with hope as he thought, surely this Raja will give me what I need. But instead of giving the beggar rice, he said to the beggar, give me your rice. The beggar was startled. Give you my rice. Give me your rice. And so begrudgingly, the beggar took out a grain of rice and gave it to the Raja. Now give me another. He reached in and gave another. I want another one as well. He gave him another. By this time, the beggar was seething with anger. Why would this wealthy man who had so much demand that from somebody who had so little? Finally, the Raja ascended back into the chariot and rode away. The poor man looked into his bowl and noticed something, something sparkling. He looked in there and he saw a grain of gold. And then he saw another grain of gold and another grain of gold. For every grain of rice the beggar had given the Raja, the Raja had exchanged it for a grain of gold. You know, exchanging rice for gold is a pretty savvy trade. But exchanging the temporary pleasures and treasures of this life for eternal rewards in the next life, that's a real lucrative transaction. That's what rewards in heaven are all about. Trading the temporal for the eternal. For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ that each one of us may be rewarded for what we've done in the body, whether it be good or worthless. Joy and regret can exist at the same time. That will be the experience of those who watch the deeds of their lives burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. And my prayer is that today's message has shown you the importance of investing your life in things that will truly make an eternal difference. Well, none of us knows when we'll be called away into God's presence. It's important to be ready at any moment. And next time, I'm going to share with you how you can prepare for your journey to heaven. Stay tuned for a preview of what's coming up next in our series, A Place Called Heaven. I mean, do you know any man who would mind exchanging his old ripped up pajamas for a new Brioni suit? Do you know any woman who would give up exchanging her bathrobe for a Chanel dress? That's exactly the exchange we make at death. Join us next time for the message, How Can I Prepare for My Journey to Heaven? Here on Pathway to Victory 